You're watching the Metaphysical Mentor Podcast with Michael Philpott. Hello, everybody. Thank you so much for tuning into the show. This is the Metaphysical Mentor Podcast. And of course, I'm your host, Michael Philpott. And joining me back on the show again, the fan favorite, uh, Mr. John <laughs> Ben Aachen. Yes, John, you are my fan favorite. So many people loved the episode we did about ancient Egypt. Uh, we talked about Edgar right. Casey and 2038. So it's been, right. my, been my most popular. But I wanted to have you back on because... You are kind of the expert in this field. So I wanted to talk about Atlantis and how amazing that is. So how are you, my friend? I'm uh, good. I'm good. And um, I guess Egypt was Edgar Casey's top topic, but second to it had to be Atlantis. So yeah. we, have, we have much we could cover. Um, and uh, according to him, all of us watching together here tonight, um, had to have had an incarnation in Atlantis. It lasted for over 200,000 years. Very likely, we our souls visited at least once in 200,000 years. <laughs> yeah, it's, it's so amazing. Well, I mean, I really appreciate you sending me your book because it was really uh, an in-depth approach to Atlantis uh, from the Edgar Cayce's perspective. But as I did more research... I realized that everybody uses Edgar Casey in their research about Atlantis. So you start reading other other authors and things like that. You find that it's like they're just quoting Edgar Casey. Everything that he talked about and everything that you talked about in your book is exactly what they're talking about. And there's just so much to unravel. And I figured if we if we can just start off just something just as really kind of basic is the location. Because I know there's a lot. Of, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. Th there's just so much information out there. And a lot of people have been talking about recently that there's these new ideas that it's the Riyadh structure in the Sahara, or yeah. it's a city somewhere in the Greek islands. So maybe we can get some clarification of as a, where's the location of it? And was it a continent or is it, was it a city? Okay. Um, now, I'm going to give you Edgar Casey's channeled information from the universal consciousness and the Akashic record. That's what you're going to hear from me. Perfect. He said it was a massive continent from the Caribbean Ocean all the way across the Atlantic to the Straits of Gibraltar, which Plato seems to support. The Pillars of Hercules is the way Plato wrote about it, which are the Gibraltar. Uh, so, uh, and it reached north toward Ireland and uh, England, Scotland, Wales. Um, and apparently some part of it reached towards the northeastern United States. And then it came south down uh into an area that would allow travel easily to the Yucatan Peninsula and to Africa. So it was a massive continent. However, due to some of the loss of, loss of attunement and the mistuning of their great crystals, now remember, we're talking over a 200,000 year period, yeah. the continent broke into five islands. Okay. Uh, nature, uh, tectonic plates broke apart because of the vibrations <clears throat> being off. Um, according to Casey, the Atlanteans were using their crystals to channel radiation from the sun and the stars. And they were using that energy to support their lifestyle and their transportation ability and Edgar describes clearly they could their machines their vessels could travel underwater around the earth through the atmosphere and beyond into the um, solar system now we find support for this in the Ramayana of India ancient India in which they actually describe planets in the system and travel to those. And it's an ancient document, very similar 
to our, our um, Iliad and Odyssey. It's, in other words, it's a poetic story of great detail. And so very similar to the Iliad and the Odyssey. Now, those five islands then broke up into only three left. Okay. And finally, there was only one, Poseidia, and that's where the city was. Okay. So, so, you, so, so you get, is, yeah. So, so that's what, what uh, Plato was describing was that particular city. Yes, uh, and, as far and as it was uh, concentric circles like uh, you hear others uh, talk about. Now, so that's probably it, where the confusion gets. They don't realize it was a bigger piece. And then basically what was left was eventually after they destroyed it was that small city. Yes, that's okay. true. Now, Edgar points to the Sargasso Sea, which you remember Columbus and his three ships when they were sailing across the Atlantic, they came upon the Sargasso Sea full of all of this vegetation. They thought they were close to land. And uh, Columbus kept dropping that measuring uh, uh, rope off the side, and he could never hit the bottom. So he decided, wait a minute, I don't know what all this vegetation is, but we got to keep going. The Sargasso Sea is a region in the middle of the Atlantic Ocean. And that, according to Casey, beneath that, in deep water, are significant portions of ancient Atlantis. And then he said the temple you could find from Atlantis is off the coast of the small island called Bimini, which is part of the Bahamas. And we've researched Bimini uh, thoroughly for years, uh, archaeologically, and, um, and we have found significant stuff, but most of it's covered in coral, and you're not allowed to damage coral. So you have to wait for Mother Nature to send a hurricane over and tear the coral off. <laughs> and in some cases, it did do that. And uh, we published all of this up on the Internet. Uh, but anyway, that's kind of the story. <laughs> yeah, it's so fascinating. And one of the things I was really interested, I know recently there was a, a famous author that did a, you know, a TV special uh, on one of the streaming services and they were talking about this and talking a little bit about it, but they never really mentioned Casey. And I was listening to the, and I was like, wait a minute. That's what, that's what the Edgar Casey was talking about, about Bimini and the structures there. And, you know, most people would say that it's a, it's, it's basically man-made. It wasn't man-made. It was from the natural currents and this is what it is, but it's just, it's too perfect. And then everything that Casey was talking about in the readings, it just really makes sense. So one of the things I was very curious about, and I'm trying to go through a timeline and really help people understand uh, about the readings, is about, you said 200,000 years ago. It was uh, 210,000 BC. Was that That's the first Atlantean civilization, like the first physical incarnate in bodies yeah, at that time? Yeah, but it's... it's different than the way we live today. Let me explain that. Please do. Edgar Edgar already told us about Lemuria and Mu being a massive um, push into matter of the children of God, the spirits uh, of the children of God into matter. But they didn't actually incarnate like we do, but they were here in the third dimension and they could influence it and they were also influenced by it. And that's where we get our legends of these uh, creatures that are half mermaid, uh, half fish, half woman, uh, half horse, half man. All those uh, mythological creatures was where they were pushing their minds and spirits into physical forms that were already here. There were no human bodies. Okay. And there, however, there were the higher apes eventually, but not during the... Uh, period of the dinosaurs that they could be here during that period, but they weren't pushing into those later as the ice ages started, uh, they got involved. And so that would be the period of the saber tooth tigers and the woolly mammoths and all that jazz. Uh, they were getting involved, uh, too, too deeply and somewhat possessed. So a group of souls 
there are several soul groups okay. decided, hey, we need, a, we need a new start and we need to accept that we're going to have to go into matter for a period of time. And Atlantis was the decision. Okay. 200,000, uh, 210,000 years ago. And that started the journey. Now, if you look in Genesis, up until you get to chapter 2 in Genesis and about verse 26, 28, somewhere in there, we're, we're one gender united. We're homogenous, uh, amaphroditic. When God cast a sleep over Adam, now at this time, Adam is a lowercase a, which means in Hebrew, a being. And they translate it in numbers and other chapters of the Bible, a person, a being, not okay. man. For some reason, the translators in Genesis translate little a Adam as a man, which le leaves us the illusion of a male, which wasn't the case. So God casts sleep over little a Adam and pulls out the feminine. Kava is the first Hebrew word used, which means the life giver. And in Hebrew, uh, Shah is, is male and Isha is female. So you okay. see, they're both Shah, but one has the womb. So you could say uh, male with womb or wombed male and male. <laughs> And this is what Edgar and, and ancient cultures teach about. Well, Edgar Casey says that first happened in Atlantis when they realized that this was a dimension of duality, even though duality is an illusion. This was a dimension of duality. And yin and yang, though united in one soul, is now expressed separately. Okay. And that was the beginning in Atlantis. And, and, and that started this, uh, the feminine body and the masculine body. Yes, so, I, was, I was wondering if there was, uh, as far as I was looking at the, the reading, it was like, this was when Lilith and yeah. Amelius came into that. So can you talk about that? Because are they the, considered the first Adam and Eve as in the biblical terms? Yeah, in Casey's uh, uh, long story of the ancient co times, long before the Garden of Eden, which was much more physical, there was a mental, spiritual uh, immersion into this world of an Adamic uh, body, but not as dense, he says, as our body. And the Hopi tell us that that body, you could come and go. It didn't possess you. You didn't have to wait for death to leave. It, you could manifest it or, or retreat with it. It was a part of your projection. And so for about um, the first 106,000 years of Atlantis, this uh, initial uh, Adam and Eve expression was going on. And there was a central figure uh, and the feminine in that central figure was the ancient name Lilith. And all the Hebrews have it in their ancient story. Lilith was the first female. And then Amelius was the first Adam type uh, Yang uh, male uh, expression. Now, these two were very tied uh, because we're not as dense in, in Atlantis. Our bodies are not that fixed. And and as the Hopi told you, you could express it or retreat with it, you know. So you have to think of it as a very different reality than we know today. But yes, the, he says, uh, Eden first occurred in Atlantis, and the first Adam and Eve were Amelius and Lilith. Then that failed due to a lot of things that we could discuss. And uh, the islands started breaking up, and the first creation, which is called the uh, age of Lemuria and Atlantis, was over. And you go to Genesis chapter six, and you see where God says, hey, we're going to start over. I don't like where this headed. And in chapter six of Genesis, you actually have the cleansing and the second creation occurs. 
And that's when you start with all of the stuff that we know uh, pretty much historically. But the other stuff is prehistoric legend and lore. Okay, so that was, uh, I was always fascinated by that in the correlation, because I know you talked about that, about Genesis and that. And because, I, you know, for a lot of people who, who are Christian, we, you know, you kind of, you read about that, you were taught about that, and you kind of, yeah, yeah, yeah. But then when you have that actual information about how Casey described that, and yeah. the process of that. So at that time, so we were separating that in that particular time, like 100, uh, 106,000 BC, we were separated. That was the time we started separating into like the physical bodies that we have here, like the men and women at that time. Just not so dense. Not so uh, dense. Our, our bodies were much subtler and they didn't possess our souls and our minds so completely as they do today. So we could still, if we wanted to say, you know what, I don't like this place. I want to go back home and hang out in the stars somewhere. In, in fact, he gives readings that are, are about souls who actually did that. One of my favorites, um, he said, and then she became disturbed with the way things were going here. And she withdrew to the deeper meditations in Mercury, the dimensions of Mercury, not on the planet. <laughs> and, uh, that's the way I'd like to go, you know, Mike. I'd like to say, uh, I'm, uh, I'm going to withdraw to the deeper meditations in Jupiter or, or Venus or whatever. If Apparently, that, souls could do that. I'm sure if anybody probably could do it after all the years you've been practicing meditation and all the crazy oh, stuff that no. you have been, I'm sure one day you'll be in Egypt. You'll be in the temple somewhere. And all of a sudden you said, you know, pop, I'm gone. You know, I've well, heard it'll you. be a future incarnation <laughs> because I've been in the temple and in the king's chamber nearly 50 times and I've had high experiences, but nothing transcending physicality like what he was describing. <laughs> Not yet. I mean, there's always no, a possibility. No. <laughs> there's always a possibility. Yeah, possibility. It'll, be, it'll possibility. be a future incarnation. <laughs> yeah. Oh my gosh. So, okay. So from there, I, I, I always get kind of confused at the timeline because there were some, there were some facts in there that kind of jump that I wasn't quite sure. Cause it kind of goes from a hundred thousand BC and that's when we had the separation. And then it kind of jumps to like the, the first kind of destruction of Atlantis where the five nations come together. Now, prior to that, they talk about the five nations, but then there's the five Adams and Eves where we separated into the different categories, the different races. Now, yes. when was that? Was that after we became Emilia and Lilith separated and we became a little into this more physical body? Uh, they it's, were saying about 60,000 BC. Was that correct? Uh, you see, for me, I don't want to fix it because I would say in the first uh, now, we start at 210,000 B.C. I would say during that first 100,000 years, somewhere in there, Edgar Casey said the soul group met. Now, by the way, the Mayans keep this in their legend. They said the souls had a powwow. They came together uh, in the seven caves, and they discussed their challenge of being in matter. And they decided, listen, we're going to break into five races. They didn't use the word races, five groups. But it turned out to be what we know today as the five races in five locations on the planet, not in Atlantis. Atlantis would be one of the five. And Edgar gives the five locations where they did this. And each will take on one of the five senses and master it. And then we'll all come back together and benefit from the division of labor and what we all learned individually by applying it. Now, souls, individual souls are not locked into one of the five. They can jump around through incarnations. But their initial one of the five fixes them as a certain Eve and a child of that Eve. So okay. like the uh, Japanese have big stories about the five Eves. Um, and Edgar says that that happened during the early periods of Atlantis 
and uh, the locations. Uh, do you want me to give you the sure, location? Sure, absolutely. Yeah, let's, let's as much detail okay. as you can throw at me. Perfect. Uh, okay, so the red race um, was Atlantean. The yellow race was Asian in the Gobi Desert, which Edgar says was not a desert back then. It was a glorious place. And that we in the future are going to discover the golden temple under that desert. And we're going to be shocked because nothing of modern skill could have built the golden temple. Wow. It's kind of like the way people look at the Great Pyramid and scratch their heads going, how could they build this? <laughs> you know? um, and let's see, the Andes Mountains was the brown race. Of course, the black race was uh, Africa. Now, um, we're not sure, but it, it could be an pre-ancestors of the Nubians because we find a Stonehenge down in Nubia and the Nubian regions in Africa that predates the Stonehenge in England. So a lot of people feel like that. Now, the white race, of course, comes from uh, Caucasians, which is the Caucasus Mountains the Caucasus Mountains and the Carpathian Mountains. He uses both of them, which is north uh, western India, sort of. And so that's the way uh, Edgar Casey uh, outlined it. Now, he did say that um, the Atlanteans, red race, okay, migrated yeah. from Atlantis and became the Iroquois Indians, but he specifically said the royal Iroquois. Okay. Because later the Iroquois uh, inbred with other nations, but initially the royal Iroquois. And where this gets interesting is he said, in the ancient times before the great flood, feminine was dominant and it was natural for the females to rule. When you go to the royal Iroquois, uh, females are, it's a matriarchal, females are, run the place. I would go live in my mother-in-law's house. See, <laughs> she was in charge. Well, when I visited the Hopi uh, 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 mesas, I was sitting there with a, what I thought was the chief and a bunch of male bosses. And I said, so uh, who's the chief? And they all kind of got quiet, and <laughs> dropped their heads a little bit and said, she is. <laughs> I said, well, I want to go meet with her. Yeah. <laughs> and then she explained to me that all the property is owned by the women. And we got into a discussion and I said, well, how do you guys divorce if you get married? She said, oh, it's easy. We just put his clothes outside the hut or, or the uh, uh, house and he knows it's over. Jeez, wow. I said, oh, my goodness. So feminine in ancient times, Casey says, was the dominant force. And the Royal Iroquois reveal that they are connected to this sort of Atlantean period. Now, they also came over the Bering Strait. The Algonquins have the whole story of coming over the Bering Strait, again, um, Asian and somehow um, Atlantean mix there. Now, see, here's where it gets confused. Edgar says in ancient times, we were flying all over the place. We were not limited. Yeah. So that's what I, I was always find so fascinating because there's this big migration and how back then did we get from point A to point B? I mean, today we take a plane, we get there or we take a boat, whatever. But back right. then, like, how would you, how would somebody from the middle of the Atlantic ocean go to China? Yeah, yeah. This is interesting because the uh, ancient Ramayana that, that I referenced earlier includes stories about us flying around. Uh, and they describe the um, vehicles that were used. Vimanas is what they call them. Vimanas. I, I'm sure you've probably heard that term. Yes. And the Vimanas of India are carved and pictured, depicted, and uh, stories are written about them, very descriptive. And so Edgar says that the crystals uh, uh, allowed these individual vessels to tap into that radiation energy, stellar, stellar energy, and travel with stellar energy. And they were not limited by um, 
water or air or space. They could move through all of them. And he even talks about how the high priest Rata visited Asia and learned what they were doing in their temples, visited the uh, pre-Mayan lands that were eventually the Maya, and visited with them. And they all were sharing knowledge. Uh, wow. Fascinating. Yeah. Yeah, like I said, like once you go down this rabbit hole, there's just so <laughs> you go. There's so much to involve. Like, and this is what gave me more questions because then there's that the idea about the ancient alien theory, that you know we yeah. came in spaceships and stuff like that. Then I was through my reading through reading the research material. It seems like those aliens or gods were probably just Atlanteans using the vehicles to move from one place and to another. And then the indigenous population saw those people coming in these hot air balloons or whatever, the Zeppelin type machines, or just, you know, flying in yeah. chariots, whatever you want to call it yeah. are now there. And then they saw that because it always reminded me of like the Nazca lines because they were always yeah. saying, well, they were made to show the gods, but if the gods were just Atlanteans using right. their technology, then it kind of yeah. throws that whole, I mean, I like the idea of spaceship. It's kind of cool. But then it's like, well, maybe it was just us. Yeah, during my incarnation this time, I had the good fortune of becoming a friend of Zachariah Sitchin. Really? Who wrote a, yeah, he and I, I talked a lot. I love his stuff. He, he loved Edgar Casey. Oh, my gosh. Uh, he and I talked a lot about this. And um, his Anunnaki story, which was very fascinating, fit well with Casey's stuff only using a different spin. And I used to say to Zachariah, I said, Zachariah, the ancient aliens were us, but at a higher level of understanding, wisdom, and influence over matter. Now, you got to understand, Edgar had three waves of souls coming into the earth. The first wave was a lower level of curiosity and desire not necessarily the highest ideals. The second wave had a heartfelt feeling for those who had gotten lost uh, in their awareness of the infinity of their nature by becoming too materialistic. Okay. So a third wave, call, Jesus called them the elect. And remember, he said, if the time uh, wasn't shortened, even the elect would fall away. That's how difficult this place is for a spirit to, to be without getting possessed by the world. And so this elect were powerful, uh, maintained spiritual awareness. They could build the Great Pyramid with forces that Edgar called the powers of levitation. And perfectly carved stones without chisels and hammers. Uh, and apparently, we're going to see the Golden Temple in the Gobi eventually, and they could build that. Um, That's amazing. Yeah, but they also guided the lower level entities. Now, in Genesis, it's called the sons of God and the sons of man and the daughters of man. And okay. even the elect the sons of God got enchanted when they saw the projection of the yin in the form of a female. It was a part within them that when they saw it outside of themselves, they projected more outside because everyone wants to be one with their soul self, with the, with the yin. But the yin was actually within us. That's when, uh, uh, Carl Jung comes along and says, well, wait, wait, John, if you want full enlightenment, you've got to get in touch with your feminine side feminine within yeah. you. Okay. Because the whole consciousness is both yin and yang. And man, that just, uh, now we've been doing this since the 1970s. We, my wife was pushing me to get in touch with my feminine <laughs> all the time. My best buddy, his wife was doing the same. <laughs> But the women had to get in touch with their masculine, too. So it was a hard period. But for greater awareness, you, you couldn't leave these separate. You had to unite them. Now, that didn't mean that, that my wife, Doris, became more male. No, she was very feminine, and I retained masculinity. But we now had 
the understanding and the energetics of the complementary opposite okay. within us. So it made us better people and together we became a better couple. Wow. That's yeah, that's such a it's so fascinating. I just love the yeah. understanding yeah. because it really just expands on who we are, you know, it just much more because you just you can you look at the anthropology and it's like, okay, we came from apes and that was it, and there's this evolution stuff, but there's so much a deeper spirituality and understanding to us in our history. Like, and that's why I was always fascinated by reading the Casey material. There's just so much that brings to light. And it's just, I want to be the time where the, all the stuff that Casey says, everything like finding that the beautiful temple in, you know, in the Gobi desert and be like, told you, you know, we've been, we've been (laughs) told you, you know, this is like everything that you thought was crazy is not crazy. And you know, there's some, a a lot of truth to that. So one of the things I wanted to talk to you about was the story of this, the evolution of our consciousness and how we became these two fractions that kind of started this destruction of Atlantis. They talked about the sons of Baal. Baal, is that how you pronounce Uh, it? Belial or Belial. Belial. And then there's two ways. And the only uh, way we ever heard that name, uh, except for Casey, was the Dead Sea Scrolls. When we found the... the, Yeah, that was the first time. Yeah. The dark angel in the Dead Sea Scrolls, the lord of the dark angels, the leader was Belial or Belial. Uh, wow. B-E-L-I-A-L. Okay. And that's when we really got it. Now, it's in the scriptures too, but it was the identification in the Dead Sea Scrolls of this entity as being the leader of the dark angels. Now, we were like angels during this uh, uh, Lemurian, Atlantean early period, but around 50,000 B.C., the darkness took over and started okay. to affect any everything. And that lady I just mentioned who withdrew to the deeper meditations in Mercury, that's what drove her away. She saw the sons of Belial or Belial gaining power and influence and it disturbed her so much she withdrew from Atlantis. Okay. So that's the really the period where the first breakup is for yes. from my understanding. They had the uh, the crystal and the this all this amazing power and they decide, you know what, we're going to use it to from what I understand, they wanted to get rid of all the animals, these big animals that were causing a lot of grief. So they decided yeah. that let's let's wipe out some of these animals and in tune they started doing that. But then the second time Lantis broke up was at 22, 28,000 BC, if I can, yeah. if, I, if that's the number. Yeah, yeah that you're right. It was a mistake. It was somebody that was playing around with a crystal and made it, tuned it too high. <laughs> yeah, that's true. <laughs> you can imagine his karma when he reincarnates and gets that reading from Edgar Casey. His reading number is 440. That's who it is. Oh, and man. can you imagine him sitting there while Edgar Casey said, uh, and inadvertently, not intentionally, you mistuned the crystal and destroyed the land. <laughs> That's amazing. So at that particular time, from my understanding, that was the high period, that 28,000 yeah. BC after the second destruction. Now, well, uh, Edgar says the highest period, uh, and I, I'm not able to really develop on this much was in lemuria okay oh wow yeah yeah. he actually says lemuria was the highest point because we were still spirits and minds observing the third dimension and physicality but not uh most of us not pushing ourselves into it that was the highest point however when you started to want to possess something physical and you pushed into matter out of energy. Einstein helps us with that E equals MC squared. M is matter and E is energy. And they're both the same, one expressed in a certain form and the other expressed in energetics, energy, vibes. And so we were still mostly vibration and consciousness. But the more you pushed yourself and condensed your energy into material expression, three-dimensional form, the more 
contained you became and limited in your awareness. Okay. And uh, that that was the descending uh, involution into matter, Edgar said, out of the evolution we're on now. We're actually evolving back into spirit now, but we came out of spirit and had this involution pushing our way into matter and lost a lot of our celestial awareness, became terrestrial, which was not our natural nature. And then we had to go through a process of reawakening. Um, and Edgar says, it starts when a soul says, this, this can't be all there is to life. <laughs> as yeah. Soon as the, yeah, as soon as the soul says that, bang. It opens up to expanded awareness of, yes, you're right. There's a lot more to you and life. Yeah, that's yeah, that's so amazing. So that was particularly the, the really the downfall of, of our species. And and then from there, we just we just got it got worse. And then there was far from my understanding, but there was a lot more wars, a lot more control that was happening. And this is when I, from what I understand is that this is when a lot of the mass migrations started happening to the various places like Egypt, uh, yeah. the Yucatan, things like that. People, they kind of said, yeah. let's get out of Dodge. This place is getting way right. too crazy. Is that right. when most of the temples started happening and building um, like these temples of, of, of uh, healing and things like that at that particular time? Um. It, it goes over kind of a long period here, but yeah, you're, you're sort of right. It's, it's not so rigid. It's hard to fix it. And no one uh, got Casey to really zone in on that, the timing of the temples, uh, because you see, he even explains the original Great Pyramid was a dynamic sacred zone, a portal into the infinite. And a little monument would be built there. And then the next generation would build more on it. And eventually they build a, a true temple or a pyramid on top. Pyramids are all around the earth, even in China. And um, so you, you got to understand that once a, a portal was discovered, even by the Maya, Toltecs, Aztecs, and, and pre-Olmecs uh, and all that, once they had a portal uh, or a spiritual event occurred at a location, that became a sacred site. And the first thing was a little uh, stone pile or then a altar and then a temple around the altar, you know, and then a bigger and bigger each generation. So they span over a period of time. One thing I want to share with you that Zachariah and I uh, chatted about. Edgar Casey said that the, uh, by the way, the sons of God, Edgar said, were male and female. In fact, he's giving a reading for a female who is asking about her spirituality. And he says to her, oh, you're one of the sons of God who helped begin the, the path back to enlightenment. And he uses the word son, even though she's feminine, a female, incarnate female. But she possesses both in her qualities. So anyway. The sons of God used, according to Edgar, animal husbandry on the apes, the great apes, to form the first physical bodies for human souls to use, for children of God's souls to use. So when Zachariah writes about stuff like that, he's real close to Casey that yeah. Casey would agree that uh, there were higher uh, alien energies of a celestial heavenly nature that had the power to influence material breeding, and they chose the higher apes as the first possibility for uh, creating a human form. But Edgar said they, they could not get it to bridge over to a pure human form, and it took a long time, and then a miracle had to happen. That, that's the way he describes it. And then finally, they actually had the form and the seven spiritual centers, though he says back then you had 12, but, and we're going to have 12 again. Anyway, I don't want to get lost in all the detail. 
uh, and then souls uh, were in temples where they had to maintain purity and, and inbreed over and over. So that's where you got the temple virgin, the sacred males, and uh, birth temples. Like when you go to Egypt, you'll notice outside the main temple is a birthing temple. They, okay. they had to isolate to keep the, the genes pure and keep reproducing uh, homo sapien energies forms, genetic homo sapiens versus uh, the uh, higher ape influence in the genetic forms that we call pre-human. Okay, wow. That's, that's just kind of blows my way because that part I never heard about. <laughs> I mean, I kind of, I kind of heard about it through Zachariah's stuff a little yeah. bit, and it's been a while since I, you know, I delved into his work. But I always find it fascinating, and because you know there is like that correlation between you know what Casey was talking about and what he was talking about about the Anunnaki and this idea about you know indoctrinating, you know, developing this kind of this uh, this uh, type of workforce and things yes. like that. So one of the things I wanted to touch on is the final destruction of Atlantis. Now, from my understanding from the, the research is that they knew through their still like their spiritual connection, they knew that there was there was going to be an event that was going to happen. So that's when, you know, there was that kind of final migration outside yeah. of Atlantis to the various areas. Did they know specifically that it was going to be an uh, this kind of event story because i know a lot of people talk about the younger dryas event where it was more of a comets or asteroids was it was it comets or asteroids that was the final destruction uh no uh that that predates uh atlantis completely and has more to do with the dinosaurs and stuff like that Okay. There is one asteroid, uh, asteroid that came over the Carolinas and created the Carolina depths off of uh, the Dominican uh, and the Caribbean, and that had a destructive effect on Atlantis, but not the big one that took out the dinosaurs. Um, according to Casey, um, now remember, the females are the high priestesses and the channels of wisdom. Okay. There are male, there are males with them, uh, but these priestesses and they were channeling the warning that this was over. The first creation, God was going to, or the God forces, the infinite universal forces of life, were going to cleanse and start over. And they started to put that out. And then Edgar describes, and he actually gives readings for pilots of the vessels who were transporting souls away from Atlantis, some going to uh, North America and the Royal Iroquois, some going up into Wales and um, Ireland and uh, Scotland and, and the islands up there, some going to the Yucatan Peninsula, some going down even into South America. And of course, uh, he mentions clearly the Pyrenees Mountains and the Basque people who have a root language connected to no language on the earth today. They were, their ancestors were, <laughs> they we're talking a long time ago, their ancestors were remnants of Atlantis migrating away. And then Edgar says, from that group, they migrated into Egypt. Okay. Uh, and, and that's how Atlanteans, uh, the rumors of Atlanteans being involved in Egypt came about. Okay. So one of, one of the things I was always curious, because you spent so much time in Egypt, and you really have an a, a in-depth knowledge of uh, Egypt's history. Stuff like that. Was there anything, any, any information on the hieroglyphs that said that the Atlanteans were there, they they kind of like a record within the walls and stuff like that. Because I know one of the resting places, from what I understand, the one of the Hall of Records about the history of Atlantis is is in Egypt. But there's anything on like on the walls in the hieroglyph somewhere that you may have seen and going, okay, maybe that's what they're talking about. Uh, not the word, not okay. the name. <laughs> okay but 
there are images in some of the tombs in the valleys of the kings that are alien looking, have antennae on their heads and various other features that look uh, unhuman, non-human, beyond humanity's normal forms, or even the higher apes. <laughs> And yet there are also lots of images on celestial beings. But you won't find, or I never found, the word or the name Atlantis. Where I got that was from Plato saying he met an Egyptian high priest who told him the okay. stories out of Egypt about Atlantis and the Atlanteans. And that at that time, the Atlanteans were somewhat troublesome. They had become, from 50 BC on, arrogant, uh, selfish, uh, self-focused, uh, violent. Uh, they turned the healing crystal into a ray gun to kill the uh, Ice Age animals. Uh, and you'll notice that uh, archaeologists find woolly mammoths still chewing the food in their mouth when they're killed instantly. Wow. They have food in their mouth. That's how fast their death occurred. And they're frozen that way. And when they look and say, this creature was chewing when it was deceased, immediately, that's how fast. They didn't have time to gulp. They were dead. Um, these things are there, but I never saw anything on the walls uh, Atlantean oriented, except alien imagery, which you've seen it on the internet. Those guys go nuts over it, the ufologists, UFO people, and celestial beings. Heavenly celestial beings are everywhere. Uh, and when you read the Egyptian Book of the Dead, you see a lot of blending, especially in chapter 15 with the Great Pyramid. And um, uh, celestial stories about okay. us having levels of bodies, and one of them is w way beyond this world. Okay, so with the with the final destruction, and then the story of the transportation of the records, and there's, from my understand, Casey said there was in three locations: one in Egypt, the one in Bimini, which is under the the slime. I guess he called it the slime, of the ages. sludge of the ages. Yeah. and the other and one our is our problem in the... there. Our problem there is. Um, coral okay <laughs> they're covered we we try very hard and we find places and go wow there is definitely a human structure but it's covered in coral yeah i'm and sure the uh, other is yeah, the yucatan it was the yucatan wasn't it the yes yeah. it was yeah yeah he actually talks about an atlantean high priest who took the records and traveled to the yucatan peninsula and he first landed right on the peninsula. And then when Atlantis had its final destruction, it destroyed his temple and all. So he had to move deeper inland uh, into Guatemala mountains and buried the records there. Okay, wow. Now, you guys have done research. The ARE has done research down in the Yucatan. Is that correct? Oh, yeah. <laughs> Lots of it. Lots of it, yeah. Yeah. Um, has anybody ever came close to figuring out where it is exactly the hall of records or approximately yeah. whereabouts maybe yes and no okay. so maybe the answer is maybe maybe okay in yucatan we have used casey's description of the records being under an overhanging. Now, uh, Yucatan has mountains and forest and, and hills and temples built up on the hill, but you can come down below the hill and he says in the overhanging area, they are inside there. And we have found caves, and so have the archeologists and, and so um, have the Mormons. The Mormons have been there, we've met them there. They, they believe in underground hidden records. Remember, their, their founding uh, uh, leader with read records that were buried underground. Um, so they have this same concept that Edgar seems to express. So we know uh, some of these uh, beneath the, the uh, massive temples and the overhang, there are caves. 
we haven't been able to go deep in them. And now so much is going on dangerously in Yucatan. Uh, we, we have not been able to go back. I mean, we have both drug lords and now we have a government that's struggling to maintain. Uh, so there's a lot of challenge. So then we jump to Bimini. Uh, the problem is coral. But we put up on the internet all the stuff we found that was truly remarkable. And we hired the <clears throat> most well-known and uh, frequently booked underwater research team called Global Underwater Explorers. And they came up after shooting, and we have all the videos up online. They came back and said, you have definitely got a place that is nowhere else in the world. Wow. What we're seeing down there is not natural. And then we found out that the Bimini Road, which is beach rock, which does occur naturally, is beach rock with uh, wedge stones between layers. Nature doesn't put wedge stones to level out the beach rock. No, Some it doesn't. Human. No. So this really was a docking area. And then we found the Andros uh, Road, which was also a docking area. Then you jump to Egypt, and in the uh, front paw of the Sphinx, Edgar said, uh, beneath is the uh, Hall of Records, now, the, the thing is, all of our research, um, as you know, there is on the a Dream Stila a carving that shows a temple beneath the Sphinx, right mm -hmm. on the carving of the Dream Stila. And uh, Dr. Zahi Awas and Dr. Uh, Mark Lehner both drilled down there to drain water that was building up under the Sphinx. And... Um, they were paying attention to the possibility of hitting something. But the angle of their drill was not like the Dream Stila. On the Dream Stila, the angle requires this, but they were going a little more like this. And their mission was to get water out from under the Sphinx that could damage things. So uh, our calculation in front of the right front paw of the Sphinx is that the chamber is in the Sphinx temple. Okay. Now, that's the old temple. Right next to that temple is the valley temple, which everybody goes in. It's not the valley temple. We're talking right in front of the Sphinx, the Sphinx temple, which is ruins. It's ruins. That it must be right inside there off the right front paw. But there's no way anybody's going to give us permission to yes. dig up. I was going to ask you about that. There must be a lot of blowback about that. They're probably going, yeah, no, I don't want you guys risking, you know, demolishing the Sphinx just to find some little chamber that may or may not have some records of, of a past, uh, past uh, civilization. That is, yeah, that's, that's true. But here's <laughs> the thing that's happening in Egypt now. Every time the scientists discover a new chamber in the Great Pyramid, all the authorities go, oh, my God, imagine how much is hidden that we haven't found yet. And so this attitude is starting to open up from protect everything and keep tourism dollars flowing to, well, it attracts more tourism if we find good stuff. I'm sure, I'm sure there's kickbacks. I mean, you got to buy permits and dig permits oh, yeah, and yeah. there's a lot of shady deals. I mean, a lot of probably people are going to make a lot of money, uh, you know, if they start digging more and start discovering. I, more. I have to tell you, honestly, uh, all the years I've been in Egypt since way back in my young years, I have not found shadiness when it comes to the authorities. I know people talk about this and, uh, little statues have been stolen and sold in Europe and all. Yeah, yeah. And Europeans are giving them all back, Bob. I know all that. But I'm telling you that if you're talking about tipping um, the salesmen or tour guides, yeah, that goes on. Tipping is normal to Egypt. They have a phrase, uh, bakshish, which in Arabic literally means share the wealth. Uh, but when I've actually seen Dr. Hawass and Dr. Mark Lerner and other people involved in powerful archaeological control, I have not seen corruption, shady deals 
I'm telling you, if you legit legitimately had an archaeological degree from a university that had strong history in archaeology, you would get a permit using the normal channels. Wow. Okay. Uh, and that, I, I honestly have to share that with you. That's the way I've seen it. And I've been there. I don't know how many times uh, you, you lost count. It's probably got to be yeah. what, at least once a year. Was it at least? Oh, there were a few years. I went four times a year. Oh my gosh. I spent more time there than here. <laughs> <laughs> That's probably why your marriage lasted so long after a while. Eh? It's like you're yes. never around. You're never around. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> oh, that's amazing. So my my wife wasn't one of those who cried when I left. She said, "Bye bye, have a good time." <laughs> I have I have friends. I have married friends like that. Since her, she always says, "You know, go with your friend Mike. Leave me alone. Yeah, go go with him. Yeah, leave me alone. I, I'm fine being by myself. Leave me alone." So, yeah. do you think we'll ever find the records in our lifetime? Boy, I don't know. In our lifetime, I don't think so. Right now. We're in the, the battle between the Armageddon of the dark forces and the light forces in that area, and wars everywhere, potential explosion of the war into a greater war. Egypt's deeply involved. Uh, I, I don't think this is where the energy of the world is going right now to discovery. I think it's going to a point of light over dark um, authoritarianism over governance by the people and freedom. Uh, this is a pitch battle going on right now. Yeah. Cause I, you know, one of the things I wanted to ask you about this, and this is, I'm glad you kind of brought this up because this is what I kind of feel. It's almost like we're from my just reading about the Atlanteans and who we are. It's like, we're repeating the same cycles. Yep. And this forces of light and darkness, this this idea there's one group versus the other group, and there's people who are in control and the people who don't have control. And it, I'm just seeing this, and I just thought, you know, I'm just going to end up just like the Atlanteans. I'm just going to end up blowing shit up, and, you know, and that's yeah. it. Like, And it yeah. kind of bothers me. And I thought, I thought maybe somehow we'd evolve into a, probably a better consciousness, but it just... Well, K Casey says Atlantis is coming back. The Atlantean period is coming back because life is done in cycles. But he says the cycles are spiral. In other words, you keep rising to a higher level of challenge um, and a higher level of understanding and wisdom, uh, challenging egocentric desire and uh, uh, gratification and domination so these are rising, and, and he does say Atlanteans are reincarnating now, um, and the world is cycling toward this uh, repeat of the ancient times when we lost our way and we destroyed everything, and now we've been on this evolution up to this point, to, and we're being tested fully to see if the light will actually overcome the dark if the people will choose uh, selflessness and care and love of others rather than selfishness and self-control and self-domination. Uh, and you see the struggle in Israel right now. Uh, the Israeli, some of the Israeli people are very disturbed as to what's going on in killing so many Palestinians and yet the power people in Israel and some of the citizenry think, oh, hell with that. Let's kill them all, you know? Yeah. Uh, and within yourself, you're actually struggling all the time between this uh, uh, understanding of the importance of oneness among the community of souls versus separateness, them and us. And that leads to real brutality and ugliness. We've yeah. seen it throughout the centuries. Yeah, it just it just keeps getting ramped up. Like we, we think we're out of it just for a bit, and then nope, the, some something pops off, or you know. And I yeah. just I, I struggle sometimes because I'm usually a pretty positive guy, and yeah. I kind of I try to do the my best, you know, and try to live uh, by higher standards and stuff like that. But yeah, so I just sometimes I can't watch the news. I just thought, man, no. we, there, there's got to be yeah. something more we can do to to yeah. raise the vibration. If if Casey was alive today, what advice would he give people 
you know, that are kind of struggling right now and they're seeing this chaos, what would his kind of wisdom be? Maybe throw well, a little you, bit of your own spin on it too there, John. Okay. Well, uh, Michael, you, you understand he was alive during World War II and he was getting bags of mail from the mothers of soldiers overseas. So he was deeply involved in a world war. The whole world was at war. And he related it to the last chapter in the book of Daniel in the Bible and saying that this is the period of transition toward a new age in which all the darkness, all the dark intentions, all the dark motivations have got to come out and be and free your heart of this hatred uh, by expressing it. And then all the light souls have to come in and counterbalance that energy to get us through it. But God doesn't want any soul loss. So even evil souls are having an opportunity to scratch their heads and go, wait a minute, this can't be right. Uh, I, I can't be doing this. And if they start that very thought starts to shift their use of the gift of free will that they have been given. And so this is a struggle battle between uh, what Christians would call the antichrist energy and the Christ energy of collective love for one another. Yeah. Um, and and I, I know the prophecy says, ultimately, the light will be victorious. Uh, but a lot of souls may not make it. And mm -hmm. Jesus said, there'll be weeping and gnashing of teeth when the veil drops and everybody sees the truth. Uh, and it's over. Uh, and they'll be separated. Um, and there'll be a thousand years of peace on the earth. And do you know, in the Casey readings, he said, put it in your heart to be here then. You've been here during the rough times. Don't miss the good times. <laughs> all right. I, I, I think I'm going to sign up for that one. And I think all my listeners are going to sign up for that too yeah. as well. And yeah, uh, yeah. Um, John, you know what? We're out of time, my brother. All right. It's been wonderful. I enjoy talking with you. I, I so appreciate it. And I know my listeners appreciate you too, John. And good, good. Um, just got to think, just anything happening at the ARE? You got a couple of minutes here. You can talk about the ARE, what's happening there. Talk about uh, donations, you know, memberships. What, what's going on at uh, down there in Virginia Beach at the ARE these days? Well, I'm going to be doing a Canadian uh, Zoom program of February. Let me see. I think it's February 23 to 25. So uh, you Canadians up there, check it out. And North Americans, check it out. You can all join. Uh, and we're going to cover a lot of different things uh, during that uh, Zoom retreat. Um, Edgar, uh, the ARE Center here is doing a lot more Zoom uh, because travel and uh, uh, the, the residual effects of COVID, yeah. which killed us back in 2020, it did a lot of damage uh, for everybody. Yeah, yeah. So physical travel is, has subdued a great deal. So we're doing a lot more Zooms and online, on-demand videos with uh, YouTube. I mean, I've been doing a lot of YouTube stuff. I've been seeing that. It's amazing. Yeah, well, that that's where ARE is right now. And we've got a great uh, audiovisual uh, center, uh, well, high technology uh, and well managed, um, so that's where we're at right now. Uh, uh, the the magazine, the membership magazine, has just come out in a new form, and I'm editor of that. And we put together a lot of good content in there, and of course, it's online, so you can go and download a PDF of the magazine and view it at your leisure. Uh, there are 18 to 20 one-page articles on key topics that you'll enjoy. And then there are about three four-page in-depth articles I know you will enjoy. Um, so you, you might want to check that out. Uh, so things are okay. I mean, we're, we're keeping on, keeping on despite uh, the world condition. 
<laughs> yeah. and the residue of COVID. Yeah, it's it's amazing. Yeah, I always say everybody, you know, everybody knows who listens to this channel. I've always been a big fan. It's uh, of the ARE and Edgar Casey's work, and of course, you, my friend. I, I've read several of your books there, um, and I've always enjoyed our conversations, stuff like that. So, if you guys are listening, you want to uh, get some more information about the ARE, it's you know, you go online there. You can check out the website. They got some great information, uh, especially if you're into health readings and all the the beautiful health readings that Edgar Casey did and all the different treatments. If you have an ailment, you can go online. There's such a, a vast uh, ma majority of information you can get on the website too as well. And of course, you want to throw an extra couple of dollars their way. It always helps out uh, to donate <laughs> and to support the guys. Just like myself, if you want to support my channel, I, I, you can do I the try. same thing, you know? <laughs> I need to get some gas money once in a while because, you know, Amen. You, yeah. you know, in Canada, everything is three times more expensive than any other place in the world these days. But uh -huh. uh, yeah, it's it's absolutely uh, crazy. Now, the the website in the U.S. is edgarcasey.org. Now, does Canada, doesn't Canada have a unique website or am I wrong about that? I don't think so. If you go on are.org, you just go, it goes right to your site. So it goes go, right to, okay, good. Yeah. Good. There's, yeah. There's no issues yet. The, the, the government hasn't censored everything yet on our end. Oh, so right. we still, we can still get the American content too as well, but yeah, go to are.org. Uh, okay. Check it out again, John. Thank you so much for spending some time with me. I know you're a busy man and I, I enjoyed always, it always very appreciate much. it. Yes. Thank I you, my enjoyed friend. It. Thank you for inviting me. So I'm just going to close out the podcast here. This has been the Metaphysical Mentor Podcast with Michael Philpott. Thank you so much for tuning in and goodbye for now.